Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Yehuda Katz. I'm here to speak about writing code that doesn't suck. Um, some other interesting facts. Uh, I work for Engine Yard. Engine Yard's an awesome place to work. Uh, there wouldn't really be Merv without Engine Yard or some other cool things we're working on. Um, but I'm especially gratified that I've had a good opportunity for the past year or so to work on Merb for a big chunk of that time. And I think it really shows when you have the opportunity to, to work on something, the difference between sort of the scattered approach to putting something together and being able to focus hard on it, coming up with a vision and being able to drive it forward really matters. So thank you, Engine Yard, for that. Um, Engine Yard also does Rubinius and another project called Vertebra that we're sort of working on, it's been announced. So yeah, engineer is cool. Hooray. So that wasn't a sarcastic hooray. It was a transitional, <laughs> transitional hooray. So I don't really have to sell people on tests here in Rubyland um, because there's the path that we've been sold and that I think Rails really taught us, but it's really a path that we've been, that we've adopted and embraced as a Ruby community. And we think that, this, that there's a solution here for writing good code, code that doesn't suck. So usually goes like this, write good tests. And there's usually like five or six talks at every one of these conferences about what good tests mean. So immediately um, we have a path, but we actually don't really agree about what the path is. So, and people vehemently disagree about what the path is. Uh, but step one is write good tests, right? Step two is have a CI suite, so make sure your code doesn't break, and then profit. Right? So usually that's, that's the story. That's what we're told. We're told tests are important. We all say, yes, we agree tests are important. Um, everybody says, write good tests, and people feel like they write good tests. And we have talks about how to use Arcov to show that you're covering your code. Um, very few talks about what entails a good test, but a lot of talks that tell you you should write tests. And we agree. Um, but then a bunch of things happen, happen where people backlash. They say, testing is horrible, right? So this is a recent post video. Hampton said, unit testing code often contains more bugs than its non-unit testing counterpart. This is the guy who wrote Hamel. Um, and then there was a testing is overrated talk, which actually doesn't say testing is bad, but it says that unit testing is just one part of a larger uh, picture. And, and they also said unit testing is overrated. It doesn't really work doesn't actually solve your problem that you want to solve. So what's going on here? Um, we all know unit testing is awesome. We should do it. Everyone thinks it's the best thing in the world and solves all our problems, and we won't write buggy code anymore if we just unit test. And then there are some high profile people that say, no, not actually useful. I person Pampton says, I personally have experienced large amounts of fail when I tried to unit test. And in fact, Pampton says, um, he, fit, he finds that his code that doesn't have any unit tests is more likely to not have bugs, primarily because he doesn't rely upon what he considers to be a flawed measure. So what's going on? So let's take a step back and review sort of what we know about testing and why we know what we know. The answer is we came from Rails. So um, yesterday, Matt asked everybody to raise their hand if they came to Ruby from Rails. I'll reiterate the question. Raise your hand if you originally, the first Ruby that you did was Rails. Right. Everybody, right? So R Rails actually had a really strong testing ethic from day one. Rails was one of the early frameworks that's actually built in testing as a primary thing that you should do with your code um, when you write Rails code. The thing is that Rails didn't really ever say what a good test was. And people sort of looked at Rails as generated tests and what other people were doing with Rails tests and sort of adopted that as that is what a good test means what people do for Rails tests. Um, but, but at no point in the, that I am aware of in the Ruby community was there ever a good, vigorous debate about what sort of test is the right sort of test and how you should test, right? There's just testing is good. Rails says testing is good. So we all laugh at the whatever other language where they have a 10% testing rate or whatever, and we think we're superior. Um, but we never really analyze this for real. Um, with that, I'm going to move on to some things that Rails does. Um, so I'm not going to talk all that much about Rails. Uh, as you probably saw in the, in the blurb, this talk is actually about how Merb used to really suck. But I, there's some things that Rails does that really sucks in terms of design that I can't, Merb never did, even though we really sucked pretty bad earlier. 
there's some things that even we didn't do. So I have to dig into Rails to, sh to show the point that I'm trying to show. Um, and the first thing is this alias method chain thing. And um, people have heard me say this before, but I'll just, I looked around for a mailing list post that sort of made clear what was going on. And there was an early mailing list post in 2006 that said, if you're unfamiliar with this method, read it. You might never use it since it's internal to Rails, but study it nevertheless to sharpen your Ruby mind. And people probably have heard me say, alias method chain sucks and probably don't use it, but probably sick of hearing me talk about alias method chain. So why do I always talk about alias method chain? Why do I think it's so bad? And the answer is it's an exemplar for a pattern that Rails uses that makes the writing good code really hard. And that it's an exemplar for Ruby as an API. Um, we have an awesome language in Ruby. Uh, Ruby is a really great language. It lets you extend, modify, dynamically, do metaprogramming. You can do a lot of stuff at runtime, which means you can modify, extend, use, abuse other people's code. And a lot of people sit, think that since Ruby is so good at manipulating other people's code, you should just use Ruby as an API. And in fact, that's sort of Rails' philosophy. They say, we, why do you need an API? Just alias method chain, whatever you want to extend. We don't need to provide you with a hook, right? We don't need a hook. We don't need to tell you what methods are meant to be used and what methods are not meant to be reused. I think the best I've ever heard is if it's not no docked, it's public. Which, uh, yeah. So this philosophy is Ruby is an API. And in fact, it, it works pretty good um, when you have some code and you're modifying it and you have a small amount of it. But it really defies maintainability and code reuse. So when you have this big tangled mass of everybody alias method chaining everybody else's code and no defined notion of where you should hook into somebody else's code, you end up with a tangled mass of things that work well, um, but a tangled mass of things that as the whole become very hard to maintain and near impossible to reuse. And, and that was my experience doing Rails in general and part of why I originally moved to Merb was this problem of as the community got larger and there were more and more things modifying how Rails worked, uh, the chance of collision, conflicts, this plugin doesn't work with that plugin, got higher. And I think it's only gotten, I haven't used Rails really for anything significant in about a year, but I think that problem has gotten worse from what I hear um, in terms of having to magically know what versions of plugins work with other versions of plugins, what versions of plugins work with Rails. Um, and so tangled masses of things are not good. And so alias method chain is an exemplar for that problem of just use Ruby as an API. We'll sort it out. Ruby is very good. It lets you modify things at runtime. So I'm going to talk about, a lot, every so often I say this and I get some objections. So let's talk about why people want to use alias method chain. So the argument goes Ruby is inherently dynamic and it doesn't have interfaces on purpose, right? If you ask Matt, he'll tell you, I don't want interfaces in the language. I think it's a bad idea. And so why not? Why make my code Java? Sort of the, the uh, small version of the argument. Why are you telling me that I have to turn my wonderful, dynamic, extensible Ruby code into this static, interfacey Java thing? Um, and Rails embraces this philosophy of dynamic is good, interfaces are bad. Um, they have alias method chain. You, everybody extends native think types directly. It's very common to do um, active record base dot send include some module. So you're extending active record base directly. Um, there's no notion of when certain extensions might be dangerous and no notion of what's likely to change. So um, because of the fact that it's Ruby, people who like alias method chain embrace this fact. They say, we're just going to change whatever we want. Anybody can change it. You just have to deal with this. You have to deal with the fact that it's a dynamic language and there's, no, there's not, just not going to be any interfaces. Um, and there's also no notion of what's considered to be private to the library because the argument goes, why should there be anything private? Why shouldn't you be able to just call things? And I remember a year or two ago, there was a, a strong stream, strain of thought that said that the private and protected are actually just hints. They're not really meant to be real. And so just don't private or protect anything. Everything is public because it's Ruby, right? So where, where does this break down? Where does this philosophy break down? Um, the first place where it breaks down is modularity. Uh, you can't easily modularize your code if there's no known 
places to plug in. So you could start modularizing your code, but it breaks down very quickly when you start to do it. Um, we learned this very quickly when we started with MERV 0.9, and we decided that we wanted all the pieces of code, sort of like the way Unix works with, have small things that are good at what they do best and you could hook them together. We wanted modular code. And what we discovered very quickly was that if we didn't have extremely well-defined entry points into each module, it became nightmarish to maintain 20 modules, right? So modularity is the first place where this notion of Ruby as an API breaks down. Uh, the second place where it breaks down is future-proofing. Um, the people who talk about Ruby as a dynamic language are really talk for, coming from the perspective of rapid prototyping and development, but they're not, they're completely ignoring the fact that when you do that, you are unable to look into the future and uh, write code that will work against a future version of whatever code that you're writing against. And, and I would say not only do they not, it's not that they don't deal with the problem, they actually embrace the fact that that isn't true, right? Because Ruby's a dynamic language, it's a good thing. Um, so that's for libraries. For web apps, what I mean by future-proof is that when you write maintainable code, you only use extension points in your own code that you're personally committed to maintaining, right? So you make sure that your models have extension points that are, that you're gonna continue to maintain in your controller. Um, and you don't just use any model. You don't uh, just expose everything as an adder accessor. Right? You, only may, you only expose a few extension points that you're personally committed to maintaining in the future and you use those in other parts of your app. Uh, perhaps the biggest problem of alias method chain is just that it's bad design, right? So I'm gonna read a little, a short quote from uh, Interface Oriented Design, the book. And, uh, this is from the introduction. Designs that em emphasize interfaces are loosely coupled and that's a good thing. If you have only an interface to which to code, you cannot write code dependent on an implementation which keeps us honest. And in fact, everywhere other than Ruby, in every other language, it's sort of accepted that this is true. Um, that you should write, you should, good design entails thinking about and designing the interfaces that you're building. By bad design, what I really mean is coupling. And uh, coupling violates something called the single responsibility principle which basically means that you have objects that are good at one thing that talk to each other through small interfaces. The most obvious example of this, again, is Unix piping, where you have a few very small, simple apps that know how to do very simple things. They have one extension point, the pipe, right? And yet they can do all sorts of wonderful things. And you don't have to worry about those extension points breaking because there's only one of them. It's wonderfully future-proof. All you have to do is design an app that reads standard in and it works, right? So, Single responsibility principle, sing, sing, simple extension points. These are actually really good things for good design. When you don't have these things, you end up with really bad design, sort of accepted um, as how it is. Um, so just gets back to the tangled wires problem, right? You want to design something that doesn't end up in a heap of scrambled tangled wires. So what do we do? First thing to do is read this book. Um, this book is. I'm, I feel like I'm being Giles here who pimps large numbers of books, but when I first started thinking about interface-oriented design about a year or so ago, when we started working, working on MERB, um, I hadn't really, I'm not a CS person, um, I read a lot of books, but I, so I never really, I don't know what sort of strains of thought there are out there. And I started sort of cohesivizing the idea and I discovered that there was a book that's pretty old in terms of um, Ruby pragmatic programmer world. It's, um, one of their first books, and it goes through step by step what interface-oriented design means, uh, what, what sort of this talk is about. Um, step one is you interface with the outside world. In a library, that's your API. So you're gonna write some way that your library interacts with the outside world. That's what I mean by interfaces. In a web app, that's your request response cycle, right? Your, the way that your app interacts with the outside world is through the requests and responses. It's possible, you have, it's possible you have other internal interfaces, and you probably want to design these also in accordance with interface-oriented design, but I'm not really talking about these interfaces today, and I probably will uh, have to deal with these in uh, question-answer period. Um, what I'm talking about external interfaces today, the interfaces that you expose to the outside world and that other people come to rely on. The reason that I care about these is that those, these interfaces are the ones that if you break, other people will care, 
And it's possible that in your own app, you, you can segment out your own app so that some part of your app cares about the interface of another part of your app. And that's, I would consider that also an external, dependence, uh, external interface. Um, what I don't consider an, uh, an external interface is like your helpers, right? Because the only thing that cares about your helpers are your views. If you split a helper into two helpers or you move a helper in line, that doesn't actually modify the interface. If you did that, no, nothing broke, right? If you take a helper and break it into two separate helpers and the app still works perfectly fine, that doesn't break anything. So while there may possibly be some internal interface that may have broken, I'm not really talking about those interfaces today and I don't think that regression suites actually care about these and we'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, which brings us back to testing. So Hampton said, unit tested code often contains more bugs than its non-unit testing counterpart. Uh, I have an alternative hypothesis. Unit tests are not regression tests. And by that I mean unit tests of internal code are not regression tests. What am I saying here? Um, what I'm saying is that a lot of people when they come to abandon testing, they've spent a lot of time unit testing internal methods and have no tests or very few tests for the thing that they actually care if it breaks, right? So in MERB, we care if render works. Um, we care that if you have a content type defined as HTML and that you ask for HTML, HTML comes out. We don't quite as much care whether the method that figures out what the content type is actually works the same way it worked yesterday. We do care that the stuff that that produces, namely that when you ask for HTML, you get back HTML, and all the edge cases that, are, that surround that, we care that that works. And so a lot of people end up writing unit tests, and Hampton, I presume, is one of these people. Um, and they test that uh, the, the method that looks up HTML works, and they've completely missed out the thing that they care about. And so they have unit tests, they feel really confident about the unit test, they feel like, uh, they've correctly unit tested the method that sh looks up HTML, but then some other part of the app breaks what they care about. And so they start feeling like this warm blanket of, of unit tests isn't really the warm blanket that the path says it is. And they start saying, it's better if I just test everything. I'll spend all my time banging on it, because at least then I know it works, when unit tests burn people, right? It's not to say unit tests are bad, I'll get into that. So I said that the talk is about code, so let's look at some examples. Uh, when we moved from MERB 05 to MERB 09, we didn't want to change the API. So uh, the brief history of MERB is that MERB was little hack, then MERB 03 was very tiny rails, MERB 04 was some extra features, and then MERB 05 was a fully feature-rich API. But when we, look, when we started looking at MERB 09, which is actually when I came to Engine Yard in the first place, we realized that there was a whole bunch of stuff in MERBO 5 that really could use a rewrite. And we were obeying the principle of write it once and throw it away. We wanted to start from scratch. And we did. That is, in fact, what we did. We started with a blank repo and started over. And we said, hey, I bet you some of these tests would be useful because we want to keep the API. So we'll just copy over these tests. What did these tests look like? So we had stuff like this, right? And this is a common MERBO 5 test. It's probably not as egregious as some of the tests you've written, but I think it's, a co it's common practice to do something kind of like this, okay? You say, you make a simple responder, and then you stub a bunch of stuff to pretend it is the method that is being used internally, the exact method, because the method that negotiates content type calls pr provided formats and returns an array with, with X X XML and HTML. But we were throwing it all and starting over. Who knows if provided formats is still what we want? We don't care about this test. Um, and we had tests after the before filter that did stuff like this. Um, we would say it should respond to perform content negotiation, right? So this stub is a serious offender. We're here, we're testing uh, whether perform content negotiation, a private method, exists at all. Like, that doesn't seem like a very useful test at all. Um, this over here, this uh, stub params and return empty hash is not portable to 09 because we don't actually call perform content negotiation anymore, right? Our methods work differently. This is an assertion we're not committed to, and on and on, right? Um, basically, we had a whole bunch of this sort of test and no test that tested what we cared about, right? We had gads and gads of tests that tested internal functionality and no test that said if you ask for HTML, you get back HTML, zero tests. And some people have 90% of their tests are perform content negotiation and 10% of them are 
tests to make sure that when you ask for HTML, you get back HTML. But the bottom line is that those tests, these tests, can't work for refactor. They're not useful, right? You have to throw them away if you actually refactor your code at all. None of this stuff works anymore. And now you have, none of this stuff works anymore. You have no tests that confirm that the stuff that you actually care about still works, right? So this is not to say unit tests are a bad thing, right? What it is to say is that we actually care about having tests so that when we refactor, we can confirm that stuff still works now. Right? We need a lot of those sort of tests, the ones that confirm that the stuff we care about still works. So what's the public API? It's if you ask for HTML, you get back HTML. So what does Mirbo 9 do? It says, go to the HTML default controller, index action. The body should be HTML default. Right? Unfortunately, there is a few non-public items here. I'll address that shortly. But it's only a few things for the entire suite. The entire suite uses these two private-ish things. Um, of course, since we're doing a real thing as opposed to testing some micro thing, we actually need a little bit of setup, but the setup is this, right? It's really simple. Um, we're actually moving to something like this, um, where you say request slash HTML default should have body HTML colon default. And if you've used Merb, you recognize this. This is the exact same kind of test that you use in your Merb apps, um, which goes through the entire rack. So, um, no, now we no longer have to rely on private interfaces at all. We rely upon the interface that we use to talk back to Rack. And um, now we have tests that cannot break no matter what if we don't change the API. So no matter what we do internally, we can't break these tests. Here's another uh, thing that we used to do. Oh, here's another thing that we do. Here's another example of a test that we do is um, controller equals dispatch, right? We say HTTP accept application XML. And then we say controller body should equal XML class provides equals true. And that would probably be converted into a test like this. Um, so we're sort of moving towards these, converting our tests over into these. Uh, the nice thing about the sort of the non-awesome test, like I said, though, is that it's, even though it's not awesome in that it uses a couple of private things, if we do change the private in interface, we only have one thing to change, and our test suite will work. Right, the dispatch helper is just a test helper. So we just change it once and everything still works. Okay. And then that's some setup. Um, here, another example, the 05 responder spec. So first of all, after every part of the 05 responder spec, we did reset default MIME types. I don't think that exists anymore in 09. But even if it does exist, it's not a private API. It's not a public API. This is also emblematic of um, weird, bad testing, which is that you're forced to clean up things that the API doesn't actually allow you to clean up. So you have a bunch of stuff you're doing, and you need to go clean up things that actually you can't. You can't unstart Merb. You can't do it, right? Once you start Merb, it's started. And we do not, maybe one day we'll let you unstart Merb, but today we don't. Um, so what a lot of people will do is they'll do a massive test thing where they'll try to figure out all the side effects of starting Merb and undo them. The problem is that if other side effects happen, um, because we change how Merb works, you have, you, your tests no longer correctly unclean up Merb. So you shouldn't use private APIs or magic APIs that you invent for your tests just to clean up things that you can't clean up. You, what we do in Merb, and this is perhaps, um, it's, it's a little bit messier than the way people normally run tests, but it's still, um, it still works perfectly, is that we run every, every spec file in its own, uh, its own process. So since we start Merb a lot in our tests, we don't want to have to unstart Merb. We just start another process. And we have a trick that we use with forking to make it not slow. So um, basically, the reason that that would normally be really slow is that you have to actually load a bunch of files over and over. right? So, um, and the benefit that you get from loading it all in one process is that those, that file load just happens once, and you reload all your, you load the files again 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 and again, right? Um, what we do uh, is that we fork right after we load all the files, but before we actually do anything. Uh, and then we jump out of the fork when we're done and start a new one. So we still get the benefit of isolation, basically sandboxing for each of our specs without the speed hit that would happen. Uh, the bottom line here, though, is that um, I think we're probably going to, we are going to um, probably package that up as a gem or expose it in some way so that people can use that same technique for their own, for their own specs. But it's not very complicated, and it's really good. The bottom line is that if you, you, if you rely on cleanup, bad things happen. We did that a lot in 05, and it just 
made our specs very unmaintainable. So we had specs like this, uh, should respond to add mime type. These are not useful specs, right? It's not actually useful to write a spec that says that some method exists on MERB, right? Um, I've seen this more than once. I sort of hesitated about including it here because it's really egregiously crazy, but I know people do this. So this is not useful because somewhere else, if you have a spec that actually calls available mime type, it will confirm that available mime types exists. You don't have to have a spec that says this method exists. It's not testing anything useful. Um, then we have it should give access to the available MIME types. We say merb.available MIME types should equal this thing here. What is that saying? It's saying that merb.available MIME types is this internal thing, which is how it's implemented, right? And actually, that let us check to make sure that what we were doing worked, but it actually just checks to make sure some internal implementation details, right? And if we change that, which of course we did in 09, right? We, just, we didn't end up using merb colon colon responder mixing colon colon rest colon colon capital types as the, the uh, storage mechanism. And in fact, we, we ended up doing a lot more complicated things with storage of my types. We have two-way hashes and whatnot. So basically, this test isn't going to work. We can't port this into 09. It doesn't actually test the thing we care about. Right? Who cares? So what's the public API? What do we actually care about? We care about the fact that when you add a MIME type, it makes it available to controllers. So here's what the 09. Um, spec looks like. Um, we say merb.add mime type, some random mime type that doesn't exist, and we use the API. To, this is one of many specs. Um, we, ch we say that it uh, takes application foo and it has this special car set, right? And then we go and we, re we request, and I'm just saying better way because this is the better way that we're moving to, right? So we say response equals request and then a controller that we set up. And then we just check to make sure that the headers of content type are the appropriate thing, that it's application foo, and it contains the car set that we set in merb.mim type. This is actually the thing that we care about. This is the thing that we want to make sure still works tomorrow. Right? This over here, not so much what I care about tomorrow. If this breaks, I don't care. Right? If this breaks, I actually care. The problem is that I can care all I want, but if I don't have a test like this, it's not going to actually be caught. Right? If I still store it in colon, colon, capital types, I'm not going to detect the error, even if I can no longer get to it from a controller. And another example here, we have to set up um, a simple scaffold. The reason I'm showing these setups is that you might assume that it would require significant amounts of effort to set up these complicated steps. That's usually what people uh, raise as an objection when I talk about this. And it just turns out to not be true. It turns out that the amount of setup that you have to do in well-factored code is minimal, right? Because you're basically testing a real interface. And if MERB was really complicated to use, people would not use it, right? So this is all you actually need to do a controller in real MERB. So it's all you need to do a controller in a test. It's possible that Rails might make it significantly harder. Don't know. So the last example here, we decided to refactor the dispatcher. So the dispatcher in 0.5 looked like this. I had to fit it on two pages. It's a lot of code. One, one method. Big method. And we decided that since most of the work of the dispatcher actually entailed dispatching a request, and actually, this is a good sign if you have a lot of static methods that have as the first parameter the same thing, um, that should be a good evidence that what you really mean to do is make it methods on that thing, right? That's sort of the C, C++ shift. And so similarly, if you have static, if you have a static, um, we don't call it static in Ruby. I don't know, what we, I don't think we have a name for it. We have class methods. So if we have a, a class that only contains class methods, right, and all the class methods take as their first parameter the same thing, that's evidence that they should not be static methods. So we decided to move it to the request. So we did this, right? Now it's now request does handle. And the request handle is still pretty small, right? Fits on one screen in relatively large font. So but we didn't actually want to break the API. A lot of people actually want their request to dispatch correctly in MERB. We assumed people wanted that. Um, so we wanted to make sure that this still worked. And had we used the 05 tests, we couldn't have possibly confirmed that everything still worked, right? Um, so we removed the request.handle some examples. Um, we decided to use, to, we w moved find route into the method, into the request. So now, Instead of inlining the thing that finds the route, we have a method called find route that does the work for us. And uh, similarly, we have a method called controller. Previously, there was a big chunk of code there that detected 
what the appropriate controller was. Turns out the request actually has all the information it needs. It doesn't even have any local uh, variables here. So we moved it into the request, right? Uh, turns out we actually could not have used the 05 test. We had to build, before we did the, 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 this dispatcher suite, we already had some tests, but we had to go back and do a tremendous amount of work to test a bunch of edge, uh, of edge cases in the dispatcher through the code that people care about, right? What, what do you care about the dispatcher? You care about the fact that when you make a request, it actually gets dispatched to the right place. If there's an error, it raises an error page. In MERB, there's a whole bunch of special error handling. We have to test that, right? But you don't actually care about what, how find route exclamation point works or whether, in fact, it goes to MERB dispatcher.handle or some other method of request.handle. None of this matters. Um, and that's sort of the point. So to summarize, there's basically three rules of testing that I personally adhere to. Number one, if you have a broken interface, at least one test will fail. Rule number two, if you have a working test, zero tests will fail. Now, this is hard, um, but we want to get to the point where this is true. And the third rule is less a rule and more a corollary, but it, write tests about what you care about, right? Write more tests, testing that the public interfaces of your application or your library work, and less tests about how the internals of your implementation work. So at this point, I usually get splattering of objections that I'm crazy and it's really hard or it's slow. And turns out that it is slow naively, but that it's possible to make it fast. So um, it's slow. First of all, the MERV test suite runs in, I think, 45 to 60 seconds for like 1,300 expectations. So it doesn't need to be slow. So this is a MERB test suite that does everything full stack. 1,300 expectations of full stack in 45 seconds. So it doesn't need to be slow. Um, our forking trick makes it faster. But my response to it's too slow is, OK, let's make it faster. Right? We can figure out how to make these tests run faster. Um, it's too slow is not an excuse to not have tests. And that's really the point. right? If you, don't, if you only have tests that test unit stuff, you don't have any tests that confirm that your code still works. MERB 05 had no tests that we were able to port over, zero tests, even though we had a lot of expectations and we felt like there was a nice security blanket. So it's too slow is not a good excuse to not write tests. It's the same objection that people make to writing tests in the first place. Right? So we need to make it faster. If it was extremely slow, if it took an hour, then we could like, have a discussion about it. Um, what I find is that it takes some extra amount of time that A is worth it and B can be optimized. And I think Merv proves that it's optimizable. Um, the second thing is it's too hard. And again, this is an objection that is raised against testing. Right? But we don't actually believe that hard testing being more hard than not writing tests is a good argument because we believe that having an automated way of confirming that your code doesn't break is worth the difficulty. Right? We already believe that. So the fact that it might be harder to test your code through the interface is not a good argument. I personally find that once you get into the groove of writing tests that test what you care about, you find that the sort of test that I showed earlier where you basically have a test that just tests the real thing that you care about. It's relatively easy. Um, in terms of applications, obviously, this requires something like WebRat. And Merb has been doing a bunch of work to make sort of acceptance tests that I'm advocating here easy. So we integrate directly with WebRat, so you can do things like um, you know, visit some URL, click link, fill in these fields, click submit button, right, all on your tests. And so it's too hard is A, if it, that's nice that it's too hard, but you actually want to have tests, and the other things aren't actually regression tests. And B, we can also work to optimize how hard it is. Merv has been, um, I think, on the forefront of optimizing that. We have, uh, we've been working directly with WebRat, including at this conference, to finally release something that's really a good integrated solution. Another argument is that unit tests are useful. And that is, in fact, true. Unit tests are very useful. They just aren't regression tests. Um, Unit tests are very useful for isolation, when you find a failure, being able to figure out where it is. They're very useful for design. So I personally find that writing unit tests as I'm designing something helps me think out the problem. Um, I think other people find that they think out the problem better without unit tests. I just disagree. I find it easier to use unit tests. But they just aren't regression tests, right? Those tests, which are effectively what I showed earlier, um, possibly not as egregious, but roughly that, 
just aren't regression tests. They don't confirm that the things you care about still work. And you should be building regression tests that work. You can also build unit tests. Um, I feel like I have to say this at every time I ever give a talk about this. I am not saying you should stop writing unit tests. I'm saying that you should swing the focus towards writing tests that actually test what you care about. And swing the focus towards writing tests so that when you refactor code, you can actually confirm that the code still works. If you only have tests that don't do that, you're missing a big chunk of your test suite. I personally call them regression tests. I think that's the right term. Another thing that people say is, I have a crazy example. I can't, it just doesn't work that way, right? I, someone, I have a spec that's 300 pages and I implement it in a model in my app and you're telling me I have to you know, push through my app 300,000 examples just to test all these cases? And the answer is no, you actually don't have to do that. Right? You should treat it like a library or a web service. You should write a bunch of tests that test this piece of functionality as though it was a library that we're using. And then you should lock down the API and only use the exposed API. So don't treat it like another part of your app that is sort of fungible and subject to change. Treat it like something that you give due thought and, and, and care about the API, lock it down. Um, commit yourself to the API so if you refactor in the future, don't change the API that's being used in the rest of your app. Treat it like a library. Um, I, I personally usually move those things out into libraries, but maybe that doesn't make sense in your case. Bottom line is, yes, sometimes it doesn't work that way. But in that case, you need to be damn sure that your interface is solid and locked down. Bottom line, when you modify your app, you need proof that it still works. Right? That's the one thing that I want people to leave here with. Um, you want to have tests that confirm that modifications to your app do not break your app. If you don't have tests that do that, and I think that's where Hampton is coming from, he doesn't have, Hampton doesn't think tests are very useful because unit tests don't do that. And he wrote a ton of unit tests and found that he broke his app and nothing failed, right? So you need, you should be thinking about what proof you need to prove that your app works and what proof what your app does not work. Um, your regression suite should be robust. My personal rule of thumb is that I don't count unit tests towards coverage. Now, I don't mean coverage the metric, although it's a nice metric. Um, I mean that you should care that your, test, your app is covered, right? that your app is tested. And I don't count unit tests towards the coverage. So if there's a bunch of, of uh, weird, there's a bunch of um, conditionals inside of a method, I actually test all those conditionals through the full stack testing. Sometimes it turns out that I've written my code really poorly and I should probably not have a bunch of conditionals that are 50 lines long in a method. And it turns out that when you break it up, it's easier to test. But we already knew that. Right. Okay, so that's the end of the um, talk on that. I'll take questions in a minute. I have some useful tidbits and some announcements. Um, the first one is RubyGems DLL hell. So Merv actually uses a lot of gems. Why? We want to be modular. We want to care about dependencies. And it turns out that RubyGems has some problems, and I just want to explain what those are so people know and can like, spread the word, talk about potential solutions. So here's a problem. Imagine you have a gem called foo that says gem baz, and you have another gem called bar that says gem baz equals 1.0, and you load them in that order, right? What happens is that foo, when you say gem baz, it loads baz 2.0, and then when you load bar, fail, right? Because it needs 1.0. But what's, what's the problem here, right? There's actually a way to resolve both of those dependencies such that it actually works, right? Because foo doesn't really care about what version it is. So if foo loaded bar 1.0, everything would be happy and copacetic. The problem is that we load our gems in a list, in order, right? So, and this happens a lot to us because we have a lot of gems and, a lot of, and we use gems as our dependency system. I think this probably happens in Rails, you just don't get a warning, right? So plugins could have dependencies on each other's versions and they could break and you just don't get warned when they break. It's not, uh, I don't think is a better solution. So what is my suggestion? My suggestion is that RubyGems has a facility in it, uh, should have a facility in it, please 1.4, that lets you give it a list of gems and then it will resolve what dependency. So instead of just loading a list of gems in order, which will break, which breaks the way I showed, um, allow us to give you a list of all the gems that are going to be required and it will resolve what is required. Um, we, Merb already has a system called dependency which, will, which defers the loading so we can easily make use of this. Other people can make use of it simply by, um, instead of having a bunch of gem lines, having one gem line, basically, is what I'm suggesting. 
Um, but it's actually a real problem that's only going to get worse if we don't address it head on. Um, we've had a lot of problems with, and RubyGems is not very helpful in terms of warnings and error messages. Uh, sometimes it'll just say can't load bar when it really means bar required a different version of Baz. Sometimes it'll say can't activate bar and won't tell, can't activate Baz 1.0, but it will tell you it won't tell you where it came from, right? So, in addition to it sucking, it's really hard to track down where the problem comes from. Uh, but the proposed solution is just give us a facility for resolving a lot, a bunch of gems at one time. That would be very helpful. Um, the other thing is don't use Ruby Gems 1.2. It's really bad, bunch of bugs. It exacerbates the DLL hell problem, and you should upgrade. Unfortunately, it has another bug that prevents you from upgrading it through gem update minus minus system. So the worst version of Ruby Gems ever can't be upgraded. Um, you have to download it. The reason I'm saying it to this room is that I want you to go out and tell all your Ruby friends to upgrade to 1.3 immediately. The bug that it has is that it treats development dependencies as runtime dependencies, but doesn't install them. So for instance, a lot of gems use Ho. Ho insinuates itself as a development dependency. So let's say I use parse tree. Parse tree has Ho as a development dependency. Um, in Ruby Gems 1.3, that just means if I don't actually say minus minus development when I install it, it doesn't get installed, and it doesn't get, nothing happens at runtime. In RubyGems 1.2, what happens is that it gets treated at runtime as a runtime dependency. So if I try to require parse tree at runtime and I don't have Ho installed, it explodes even though when I installed it, it never bothered to install Ho in the first place, and gives a really impossible to understand error. So that happens a lot. That's one example that we've seen a lot, but there's a whole bunch of other examples. That it, for which it could happen as people could start to use de de development dependencies more. Um, so just don't use 1.2. Uh, please download, install, and get other people to install 1.3. Some announcements. Uh, MERB 10 final is being released today. Um, Um, so we went through last night the lighthouse and um, cleaned up any bugs that were deemed showstoppers and uh, deferred things that weren't, and we're releasing today. Um, the second thing is Engine Yard is going to be offering MERV support. Um, that means support from me, which is pretty awesome, I think. Um, so you can go to engineer.com slash MERV support and sign up. Uh, I think we're starting the offering on October 17th because I'm taking a vacation until October 17th or November 17th. Um, but you can go there and sign up, and uh, we'll, we'll give you more details. The long and short of it is that there's going to be basically priority bug, bug reporting so that um, you can report a bug and get a quick turnaround answer about what's wrong, what a workaround is, and perhaps when it will be fixed. Um, and then a per incident support uh, as well, which gives you the ability to actually open an incident and talk to me and other MERV core team members about what exactly is going on. So Engine Yard is going to offer MERV support, and you can go sign up there. Can I, do we know? We're still working it out. OK. Um, the second thing is that MA Agile, which is run by uh, Matt Imanetti, MA, who is a MERV core team member, is going to be offering MERV training in quarter 109. Um, I, yeah, you can go check it out at maagile.com slash training, sign up. It's roughly patterned after the um, Agile Studio, or the Pragmatic Studio um, approach, and you can go check it out, and it's going to be cool. And I think we're, um, MA Agile is also be happy to set up, uh, if you have a corporate need for training, basically they're getting into the training business. So uh, we'll be doing training for, uh, in quarter one, and then you can hire them to do training as well. So that's pretty much all the announcements. And then I will, I have a few minutes, I'll take any questions about the first part of my talk or the second part. Yes. We have uh, Merv Day. Ah, yes. How did I forget that? Um, yeah, Merv Day Atlanta, right, is going to be December 6th. Uh, I'm speaking there, and a bunch of other cool people are speaking there. And you can find that at MervDay.com, right? Atlanta.mervday.com. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So one of the things you're talking about is trying to cover all of your cases with these basically functional tests. And if you've got four sources of freedom, and each source of freedom has four different outcomes, 
to cover a method that uses, excuse me, that uses that, you've got 256 possible tests you need to test. How do you deal with that computational explosion of cases if you want to cover everything from a functional unit? Well, so, so that would be true if you were trying to test, if you were doing full functional tests and you wanted to test every possible scenario. But you don't do that in unit testing anyway, right? In unit testing, you can't get the computational explosion. So let's, hold on, so let's assume that we don't care about the computational explosion. We don't care about testing all 256 cases. If we don't, then we could, for each le degree of freedom, we could use one, only one of the possible scenarios in the other ones. So, for instance, covering all of your cases because you're really not if there's interaction between Ah, well, so, so while I think it is useful to cover as many cases as possible, that isn't actually the point of, of what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying is that you should, test, you should test each part of your code through the public interface. So for example, um, we test render. Render has, takes a bunch of options. Render could interact with content type. It could, inter it could interact with a whole bunch of other, uh, with provides, right? And there's probably a million different options. But when we test render, all we care about is that the render method works the right way. So for the purposes of render, we test it as though, it was, as though we were unit testing it, um, so as though we were testing the method. But we don't test it through calling render. We test it through a real app. Um, and yes, that's not as ideal as if you could test a million cases, but that's out of the question anyway. We're not going to be able to test a million cases. So it, we think that it's superior to test your ca the cases where it would be very difficult to test a combinatorial explosion through the stack, right, through the black box, instead of by testing them individually, because then they could actually be used as regression tests. We can actually confirm if things break and we can refactor. You can test for each degree of freedom for each instance, and then just do a couple of those cases through the larger stack? We would not do that. So what we would do is we would, we would do unit, okay, let me step back. So what you're, basically what you're asking is, if you do real functional testing where you try to handle all scenarios, right, there's too many cases. So you want to be able to test just render, just the render method. That's what you're saying, right? So many different things. So you assume you'll need to unit test all of the things it depends upon to make sure they're correct so that you have some, because you can't test all of render or all of the entire stack, you would assume that you'll need to still do a lot of the unit testing. You'll have to have a lot of different cases in the unit testing. You have to pick the representative cases, right? Right. I, so you, either you're testing all cases, in which case just do that through functional testing, or you can't do, well, I think you're like arguing a speed thing. Is that? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it right Okay. I think there may have been conflated arguments. I'm sorry. Are there any other questions? Yes? Did you guys find in your rewrite that you had some tests that were initially really important and then like, from a design perspective, then they just didn't seem to be, um, you didn't want to maintain them, you just deleted them. So they were initially important as designing the API, but you got what you wanted, you removed them, and then you stayed with uh, higher levels. That's exactly right. So what I said a few slides back was that we actually don't, I don't think, and I don't think most of us think that unit testing is bad. Right? We actually find it to be very useful from a design perspective. I, th I think I said that. Um, it's just that you, um, we think that it's perfectly fine to delete those. And you have version, people say, oh, I want to keep it around for documentation. I hope you're using version control. And if you are, you could just go back to when you made the method and go read the tests. Right? Hopefully you're also documenting your code well. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's definitely a common pattern where you. Is that initially you said you can use the existing tests that you had Right, your application, the API not the same, and those tests are no longer valid. Right? So, but we didn't change the API. Right? We, we, the point of the 09 rewrite was not to change the API, but to, start, but to basically rebuild it from scratch architecturally. So I would have hoped that we, the 09 test could be used in such a rewrite. The 05 test could not. Yes? How do you test things um, where you're defining your code against a particular standard, say XML or UTF-8 internationalization stuff, in cases where you're not necessarily sure what you should be doing in the first place? I've only heard like three quarters of what you asked. <laughs> 
If you're in situations where you're testing um, against the standards, say UTF-8 or XML, where you can have several different standards and you're not exactly sure what the test should actually be doing. So, I don't know how to write a test that you don't know what it should be doing. If, if you're writing against UTF-8, for example, right. how do you ensure that your code is valid for UTF-8 in all circumstances? Yeah, it's going to be... I think you're asking how to do a certain kind of test, which is you want to confirm that your, your code complies with the spec, right? Is that basically, you basically have to write, you have to go through the spec and write a test suite that is a test suite for the spec. And then you can use that. Um, ideally, you're using a library that does something like that. So um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're talking to an API or, dealing with a spec, hopefully you're using an XML parser that's already XML compliant and you could trust their specs. Yes? Does MERV support cover MERV on other implementations? Does it? Sure. You mean, can someone pay for MERV support and get help with JRuby? Yeah. Yes. MERV, MERV is 100%, so, okay. I should actually address the JRuby thing in general. We spent probably 20 to 30% of our time over the past two or three weeks in the run-up to 1.0, dealing specifically with JRuby issues. We're very committed to making MERB run on JRuby. There's one current um, problem, which is that we, the database driver that Datamapper uses, which is what we use, doesn't run on JRuby, but I think that gap is gonna be closed quickly. Um, and then it, everything should work. And yes, we're very committed to it running on JRuby and any other uh, Ruby implementation that runs Rails, my criteria. Um, and Basically, we a support, I would assume, would cover that as well. Other questions? Okay, yes? Um, do you run the new specs against the old MERV, and did you do that to sort of verify the validity of them as you were refactoring? We did not. But we should have. It's too late now. <laughs> um, but, on that topic, we are, uh, we will be running the 1.0, the specs that will be released with today's release against every future version that is in the 1.x line. So we actually believe that our specs do what we say they do, which is serve as a set of regression tests. It's entirely possible that we will have failed and there will be some non-regression tests in there, but I think we'll be very loud and announce clearly that we have to change the spec suite. The idea is that the spec suite for 1.0 actually confirms the API of 1.0. We're not going to change it until 2.0. Yes? What did you take on the test first? Development? So I think it's very useful for designing someone else. Uh, what's my take on test first development? I think I personally find test first development to be very useful. I think it's an orthogonal issue to regression suites. I don't think test first development produces very useful regression suites. Um, I think test first development is very helpful for figuring out how to design something and that in the same way that you frequently write one and throw, to throw it away in real code, I find that I want, when I'm done with my unit tests, which help me design, I want to write a set of regression suites that actually test in the end what I care about. I don't want a bunch of tests lying around that test things that I ended up not caring about in the end. I'm out of time.